I think one of the things that has come through loud and clear in the course of this discussion is that essential to any successful peace process of any sort is flexibility. I might add that some of you have not been terribly flexible. Um, now, I, you know, by the way, that, that, that is reflective of a, of a problem in scenario exercises like these, which is if you are representing a group, you can only really represent it in terms of what it has done in the past. And to achieve a breakthrough, typically something has got to give, and a group has actually got to change what they've done in the past uh, and do something completely different. And so, you know, essential to moving to a new level of this would actually require different kind of behavior from some players than we've gotten. But when I began by saying flexibility is essential, I was not going for anything so substantive or elevated. Rather, I wanted to discuss for a moment the weather. <laughs> because while the U.S. Institute of Peace has a congressional mandate and the best-looking building in Washington, it apparently does not control the weather. And that's on you. Um, and having said that, we've you know, consulted the weather gurus and the people who at least have some sense of the weather, and apparently it's going to snow tomorrow rather significantly. Uh, well, it's a rumor. <laughs> but in terms of that rumor, the problem is that we would not know until tomorrow morning whether it was true or not. And in terms of people coming in and in terms of your schedule, it would be impossible to communicate to anybody in time, you know, a rescheduling. And so, because we are nimble and flexible, as befits this kind of a process, we have had a high-level consultation um, and we have concluded that we are going to conclude. In other words, we are going to skip ahead to tomorrow morning's session now. We will still end on time. You will still go to the dinner. We will still talk at the dinner. We will try to gather some information at the dinner. Um, but, and I'm sorry, you know, M Mona, you've been mixing it up the whole day. Um, um, <laughs> Um, you'll note no one is sitting on either side. Well, you know, <laughs> people are afraid. But um, the, uh, you know, the, the, we, we can talk about some of the curveballs that have been thrown in, but we've actually talked about some of them as we've been doing this thus far. Um, and in fact, of the curveballs we talked about initially in the program, you know, one of them is insurgents don't stop fighting. We've talked a lot about that. As, as driving this scenario. Another is lack of international economic or military commitment. We've talked a lot about that as part of uh, this scenario. Uh, and, you know, a third one is sort of political insurgency and, uh, you know, political competition that fragments a, a, a power sharing agreement. We didn't even get to a power sharing agreement, really. Um, and so, you know, I think we've addressed that to some extent. Whereas the next session, the, the, the morning session tomorrow, is really supposed to deal with, you know, some of our conclusions and this longer term set of issues. Like, how does this get phased? How do we get there from here? Um, and so what we're going to do now is between now and um, 5 o'clock, which is an hour and 10 minutes, we're going to go through what we were going to go through tomorrow morning in terms of establishing a sustainable peace. But as you think about this and as we go through some of the questions, what I want to do is I want to encourage you to think about what I was just talking about. Two things. One, a long, you know, if, we, if our time frame were somewhat stretched out, if we don't think the situation is ripe today, if we don't think that Russia and the U.S. and Iran are ready to go and push this forward to a particular place, what could we do now, and then what could we do next, and how might we phase ourselves into something longer? Um, uh, I, you know, I, I think that's worth considering. And the other thing I'd like you to think about is where the breakthrough may come. 
because let's not stay trapped. I mean, if I had said to you two or three years ago that the U.S. would be on the verge of a certain kind of a deal with Iran or the U.S. would have changed the, you know, we have its relationship with Saudi Arabia or its relationship with Israel or wherever, be in a somewhat different place, you, you might say, well, that's not possible. But there have been changes. And there have been changes in the positions of the Iranians in the course of this, this past six, eight months, which are rather dramatic. And I, I just would like you to open your mind and sort of guess ahead or speculate as to where the, the, those kind of substantive changes may take place. Does that sort of get you to where we want to be? Okay. So establishing a sustainable peace. Let's talk about this. And this is a little more conceptual. First slide. Um, among the countless potential outcomes, you know, one of them was a temporary ceasefire. One of them is a divided Syria. One is remnants of the regime remain, and another is recalcitrant international community. I do want to point out these slides were put together a couple of weeks ago, before all this happened, and those are sort of the four main conclusions that we've arrived at today. So, you know, perhaps that's uh, because they're all obvious or we're clairvoyant. I, I leave it to you to decide which of those two it is. Um, next. Um, in terms of the alternative outcome ceasefire, could a ceasefire be reached to allow for protection of civilians and enable a more robust response to the humanitarian crisis? Um, could a stalemate put pressure on parties to agree to a ceasefire um, and perhaps provide for some humanitarian aid and negotiating space? So, you know, this, this begs one of the questions that we had earlier. What might a process look like that produced enough progress that it could continue forward. It might not produce peace or political settlement right up front, but it might produce an abatement of suffering, uh, a reduction in hostilities, and put us on a pathway to that. So what might that look like? Next. Um, divided Syria, we've talked about this significantly, but, but you know, could you end up with um, uh, a Kurdish space, an Alawite space, an opposition space, uh, a, a rump, uh, Assad, uh, uh, well, I guess that's the Alawite space. Um, and, and how might that shape itself over time? Next. Um, we talked about remnants of the regime remaining. Um, and, uh, you know, we've actually dwelt a lot, a lot on that today, but that was one of the things that we anticipated. Next. Um, could it succeed without strong commitment from the international community? I think this, this, this question really, if you look at the way this slide is divided up, this gets into one of the core things we've been talking about today. And that is, if the international community is traditionally described, which is beyond the region, has a weak involvement, but the region has a strong involvement, what might that get us? How might that get us further along in the, in the way here? Um, and the next... Or is that the final slide? Is that the final slide? Okay, so let's go to the questions. Five quick questions. Based on the discussion over the past two days, and by that I mean one day, are you more or less likely to believe a lasting peace is attainable in Syria? More likely, less likely, or the same? Wow. Now, what am I surprised at here? That 71% of you say your views haven't changed? No. That's been the nature of the discussion. That 13% of you say you're less? No. It's that 16% of you actually, <laughs> based on today's discussion, <laughs> think it's more likely. Um, those of you've just arrived, obviously, <laughs> um, or have not been paying attention. But, um, you know, I'm glad that's as optimists keep 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 these kind of discussions going. Are you more or less optimistic about short-term prospects for a peace agreement? Okay, let's try this again. It'll be zero now now that I've played it that way, but more, less, or the same. Ah, uh, see? See? See what happens? Um, 
Okay. Next. Pardon me? Time and the time frame is a crucial element to this entire conversation. And so I really hope we get to this point of what you expect in one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, because that's a different question because you have the word short term. T -t totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, no, no, I was, I was actually saying that because of the way we'd framed it, I thought it would, it would suppress the optimist vote, whether it should or not. Um, following our discussions, do you think reaching an agreement in Geneva or negotiated resolution of the conflict more broadly is more or less critical to achieving a lasting peace? Is it more critical or less critical or the same? In other words, have you changed your view on that based on the discussion? Okay, well that's a fairly significant move, thinking it was less critical than perhaps they thought it was before. Next. Based on the previous four sessions, or as we like to refer to them, the previous three sessions, um, <laughs> what do you consider the single biggest hurdle to Syrian peace? Governance, economic reconstruction, establishing security, reconciliation and justice, or humanitarian relief and resettlement, or something else. And if you would like to say something else, then you can say something else. Seventy-three percent say establishing security. What did you have a question? I was going to say the general regional dynamics of everyone trying to meddle in Syria with different objectives and different end games in mind. Okay. Anybody else have a different view? Any 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 okay. One last question. Based uh, what will it take for the international community to remain focused on restoring and repairing Syria? Consistent advocacy in the UN semi-annual peace talks, continued increases in humanitarian aid, don't know how that does that, and spotlight on the agenda of global and economic forums, like it keeps getting brought up. <laughs> correct. That is, that, is, that is the correct answer, none of the above. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can, you can vote, or as you can, I can see there's a protest vote going on here. Uh, you say semi-annual peace talks. The reality is none of the above. Um, yes, do you want to say something? Yeah, I think the answer will be the, the stronger the jihadists get. Ironically, I think the more successful the jihadists are in taking and controlling territory and using it as a base of operations, the more the international community will decide that it has to do far more than it's doing now. How much would it have? The, the, I mean, that's going to happen. And there are a lot of predictions right now that say if you don't make... Uh, you know, some kind of peace agreement in the next year, the jihadists will gain sufficient amount of ground that it'll be uh, almost impossible to dislodge them. Is there a threshold of jihadist gains that might produce a response from the U.S. or the Europeans or from the international community? I'll start off and Cass can, can join in. I, I mean, part of it is the question of whether the jihadist threat remains internal to Syria or where the, the jihadist threat in some fashion moves beyond the borders to threaten countries that the United States has significantly more interest in, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon. Uh, if, it's, if there's a spillover, uh, I think it's far more likely uh, that, 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 as Cass was saying, it, the, the issue gets reframed. Um, but again, part of that depends on, on, on also on, on a matter of timing. I think you have a set narrative for this administration. If we're still asking this question at the beginning of 2017, you, you, you may well have a different political equation that then in turn creates possibilities that don't exist today. All right. Um, oh, <laughs> Mona is not here, but Mona's capability is not withstanding. Let's face it, the jihadists are entering uh, Syria today because of certain countries are allowing them to enter. You start closing borders, it becomes much more difficult. So this, we should not exaggerate the jihadist threat to that extent, that they will control huge territory and there will be able, there'll be a base of operations. Because they're coming in through Turkey, they're coming in through Iraq. Jordan, not that much from Jordan and not that much from, from, from Lebanon. So if you control those two borders somehow, 
then we'll, yeah, you're not going to control every jihadist. There'll still be jihadists coming in, but it's not going to be the numbers that we're talking about that will control a large chunk of Syrian territory. I think and somebody wants to address this. One of the things that strikes me is cutting off money to the jihadists strikes me as one of the ways to weaken them and ripen the situation, if you will, to use that terminology. And, um, you know, is there a potential deal anywhere where um, there might be an agreement on regional countries that are funding different components of the opposition to stop and thus, you know, move forward? George. Yeah, I, uh, I wasn't going to answer that question, no, but let me, to. okay. Uh, I, I mean, I think the timing thing, I want to go back to what Esther said. The timing thing begs a larger question since we're in the last session, and that is, do we have a strategic vision? You know, we began the morning, you astutely did with the notion of enough about war games, how about a peace game? A peace game would, would beg two things, I think. One is, what's our strategic framework for building a peace over the next decade? If we know what the end point is, how do we work through the timing dimensions and increments of a year at a time, when the engagement of civil society, when the kind of institutional supports, et cetera. So that would be a task that, that would be apropos. But the other is, I, I think, what's of the, of, of the participants around the table in their roles, what's their theory of how peace will actually come about, as opposed to our existing positions, but what's in it for Turkey in Turkey's best interest, given how they think things may change on the ground, if you did seal borders, and each actor be a little bit more accountable in those terms. And, and that's where I think we can not look for what's, what's the single event that'll break the impasse, but how the participants in the international community can create the kind of change that will actually lead to peace, that those, they can proactively do it. Those are both really good questions, and I hope I encourage you to think about answers to those questions and, 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 and raising them. I would also, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I would also add that I don't think we can think of, of ripeness as a condition that can be achieved by transforming on, uh, the circumstances of only one critical actor on the ground because of the interconnections among them. Weakening of jihadists on its own is going to have a series of interactive effects that will change the strategic calculus of a variety of actors. Okay. All right. the, the regime may view it as an opportunity to, 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 to advance its, its campaign to recover territory. The moderate opposition may see it as, an, as a chance to assert itself uh, militarily in areas now that it doesn't face jihadist competition. So we have to be aware of these interactions. Okay. But, and, and, but just as I was, I was going to say as far as George's thing, I'd like to come back to the critical players and ask the question that George posed as the question, which is, either from your own personal view or from the point of view of, of the group that you're representing here, what's your best guess as how peace unfolds based on not just this discussion, but you know the other facts that you've got informing it? George, you don't have to answer that now. I'm just saying no, I would uh, like to come to that. The, you, the question was what would change the calculus of ripeness and, whether, yeah. and, and the attitudes of external players to intervene. Right. One that has one what was mentioned was the uh, the evolution of the jihadist. I think that is a factor. Uh, somewhat related, but is uh, the fragility of the neighboring states and the transboundary effects of this. We've already expressed the concern about Jordan and the expressed the concern about Lebanon. If those two situations start to unravel very quickly, I guarantee you that that would change the attitude of the American administration about how deeply to get engaged. I think that's absolutely true. And I think Jordan more so than Lebanon, right? I think that um, there, there's a pitfall that needs to be identified when we're looking at both pushes, which would definitely bring in or pull in Western interests. One is the ev evolution of the jihadists, and one is the destabilization of the countries. And that pitfall is it transforms the type of conflict and lowers our standards. So as the jihadists increase, as in, then we're more willing to put up with a benevolent dictator, we're more willing to have Assad remain in power. And I think that in that sense, time, particularly from the Syrian civil society perspective, is not necessarily the best way to move um, forward. And, and I worry that, again, the standards continue to lower. I also just want to point out, whereas I think cutting off funding to jihadists is absolutely brilliant, I think it's also equivalent to saying, let's all hold hands so no one can hold a gun. The reality is our allies are funding 
these um, jihadists. There's a lot of interest in the jihadists. And, you know, for the past 10, 12, 13 years, we've tried to cut off funding, which is why I reintroduced the concept of engaging civil society, really cut them off at their source. If you're not cutting them off at their source, I think the problem is you keep trying to handle it in a state level. And that's why every time we think we've controlled them, they reemerge. You know, they're not, we're not waiting for them to join borders. It's now Al Qaeda, Iraq, and Sham. They now have no border. I wish we could control the Iraqi border. 13 years, we failed to control the Iraqi border. The reality is, is we need to engage the informal sector. The reality is we need to move beyond the models of security sector reform that are frankly archaic and have failed us. Otherwise, we will continue to have these conversations and the people who will pay the price will be the civilians on the ground. Esther, did you miss Thank you. Uh, just to pick up on several of the points, uh, first was going back to this issue of time. And I think actually my, uh, my uh, UN teammates point about uh, Somalia is actually a very good one. That effectively Somalia was a 20-year process. And that throughout that period you had, since there was a UN presence, an element there, uh, while the rest of the member states were off doing, doing other things. So I think you need to think about what are the pieces? What becomes the political agreement? So, and, the, and what element becomes the economic agreement? We had to think about what happens in one year. What happens in six months, one year, five years, ten years, and what has to happen to bring in all the other parties we've talked about, including civil society? But you have to have a generation-long engagement thinking about that. That you can use the multilateral tools, but only after member states agree. The, neither the Security Council nor the uh, uh, Secretar Secretariat can do that without member states themselves engaging. That does mean the U.S., Russia, had Saudi Arabia been on the Security Council or Jordan, that you have to have uh, the power so they solidify the agreement and lay out the structure so that everyone agrees to the same structure and timetable. And again, remembering in Somalia that actually the heavy lift, I do not see a, a case for a military intervention with multilateral pieces. There, are, there isn't the structure for it. The peace enforcement can't be done by the UN system on its own. The heavy lifting is usually done by one government, two governments. In the case of Somalia, it was the African Union that did the heavy lifting with the, and the, and basically the military campaign against al-Shabaab uh, with UN support, but not on its own. So if you're envisioning that, you have to say which one or two countries would going to do that. I don't see that. So you have to come up with another security structure. And finally, I'd go back to where I started at the beginning, is that you have to come up with an agreement amongst the powers, which you then take to the multilateral system, which can then provide the long-term support, because all of your major powers are going to be busy two or three years from now. But you'll need the multilateral system to kind of keep the things rolling along, and you still sort of engage periodically just to keep it going. And funding. OK, thanks. I'm going around, and there's a lot of things here. So if George, if you're done, and, and uh, Manal, you're done. Judith. Uh, and by the way, let me encourage everybody, if you're going to be talking here, rather than, I don't want to drift into a discussion of, this would be nice. Or, you know, I'd like to stay within what's possible, and I would like you to focus on things that you think could actually move this process forward over a short term or a longer term. In other words, let's stay practical in sort of the building of the elements of this truncated uh, game idea. Judith. To hit the, hit the button. Uh, one point I'll go back to the beginning, and I think that's weakness. You've got to put, get them, get them, the jihadists, in a position of weakness. But the point is, they're taking over territory. They're controlling villages and communities. They, you could cut off all the money tomorrow that comes from the Gulf. They'll be fine. After all, Hezbollah thrived when there was a lot of Iranian money or very little Iranian money. They're building communities. There are ways that they can acquire money on the ground from where they are. That's the point of what they're, what's what they're fighting for. They're fighting more for that than they're, and each other, than they're fighting the, uh, the uh, Assad forces. So my point would be, yeah, we got to stop the funding. But you've also, again, is there a model from Iraq here in the sense to build up the opposition to fight the Basahwa for Syria and that you use the locals? use the community, that they're the ones who can turn against them uh, because they are the great, uh, the jihadists are the greatest threat to the other uh, Islamists, moderate or whatever they are, and certainly to the um, secularists, whatever, they're the greatest threat. So they have to, in the end, turn against them. But just by saying, well, cut off that Gulf of money and they'll be finished, no, that won't do it. Okay, I'm trying to do this in the order I saw cards pop up, 
um, Daniel. I'll get to I'll get to everybody. But let's just stick with the discipline. What can we do constructively to move things forward, Daniel? Well, um, first of all, the, the the solution for the for the uh, radical Islamists is, is very difficult to imagine. For, for, precisely the reasons that have already been said. I, when I was in Tunisia and in Morocco, I met a lot of uh, uh, NGOs that were trying to get their Tunisian colleagues back from, uh, from Syria to Tunisia. It's become a region-wide problem, and it's threatening the stability of all of North Africa. So it's hugely uh, challenging. Um, I do want to reiterate, I, you know, I, we, it has been said before here, and I'm not sure I'm putting on my, my, my Rouhani hat or not, that the prospect looming of negotiations on the second phase of the nuclear agreement, uh, a successful uh, agreement between the United States and Iran will significantly shift all the regional calculations. And in that context, we have to, we can prepare for both failure and success, but success requires, as has been said here before, some sort of w way of managing the dialogue between Iran and I Saudi Arabia, something that Rouhani and Javad Zarif have been trying to advance. So I think this is a really critical arena that, depending on how it plays out, may open up space well, the, for solutions. The, play it out. Don't, don't take an hour, but, but take 60 seconds or two minutes. Play it out. If, there is a, if we're on a track to a deal, how does that affect this? If we're not on a track to a deal, how does that affect this? On a track two deal. If a uh, track to a deal with Iran and the U.S. on nuclear, how does well, that Well, I mean, I think if, if, if there's a successful deal, what you'll see is that the forces that represent an alternative to Ahmadinejad in Iran, who want to engage and whose central focus, if you look at Rouhani, Javad Zarif, their central focus is the Gulf. Their central focus is reviving the Iranian economy. Their central focus is international engagement. They have a, a, a very different uh, agenda, and to the extent that uh, a successful uh, uh, second phase of the negotiation empowers them, they're going to be more amenable to solutions and compromises on Syria um, at, of the kind that have been discussed. On the, on, on the other hand, if the peace process is a failure, they will be discredited and on their way out, and the Supreme Leader will, will go back to supporting the much harder line elements, and a peace deal will become much more difficult. So. I think to the extent that there is creative thinking about how to reach that deal, a satisfactory agreement, it's going to open up space. If the agreement doesn't take place, we're going to see Iran playing a much more of a spoiler role. Okay, Hans. We can talk about it. So the, the question is about ripeness, and uh, I would argue that the situation today is less ripe for a peace process than it was a year ago. And if that's true, why is that true? It's because the uh, Free Syrian army is losing. And the jihadists are in a stronger position because they're being supported by the Gulf states, and Assad is stronger because he's getting supported by Iran and Hezbollah. So things have changed on the ground, which make the situation less ripe. And if you want to make it more ripe, you reverse that. Okay, Mark. Three observations. You know, I don't think the Russians would be unhappy if the conflict continues but it leads to deterioration in relations between America on the one hand and Saudi Arabia and Qatar on the other. In other words, if these uh, two countries are seen as, as promoting the jihadists, I think what Russia would like to see that just as America has woken up to the true nature of Pakistan, it will wake up to the true nature of Saudi Arabia and Qatar, at least as Russia understands it. That's one. Second, I think that Russian uh, support for Assad might weaken under certain circumstances. Syria obviously is not occurring in a void. If Ukraine blows up, if the North Caucasus blows up, if there's a domestic crisis in Russia itself, Russia doesn't have the time or resources uh, to focus on Syria anymore, and it may simply you know, agree to let the U.S. Uh, deal with it. Russia might not there are circumstances which may make Russia less of a factor, but they don't relate to Syria itself. Third, uh, it's not so much about what Russia could do, but how Russia thinks. We're talking about the jihadists, but of course, the jihadists are divided, aren't they? And the stronger they perceive themselves to be, the more likely they are to turn on each other. And it strikes me that certainly the Russian approach would be to try to find a who's the Kadyrov among this group. <laughs> who, who is willing to do a deal to survive? And it strikes me that we shouldn't simply, you know, think about the jihadists as uniform, as monolithic, nor should we think about them as more committed to ideology than in fact simply their own power. Mona. Uh, 
speaking now not as a jihadist, I, I think I would underscore actually Manal's point about the, the importance of working at the grassroots within Syrian society is one of the most effective ways, frankly, of depriving the jihadists of the kind of support that they may get. But I also think we need to think about a de-escalation strategy from the outside as well. In other words, I think both are critical. I don't see, frankly, a Geneva II getting off the ground on January 22nd because of the ripeness issue. And therefore, what I would recommend concretely is that on January 22nd, some sort of interim conference take place that brings around the table the P5 plus one plus Iran, Saudi, Iraq, and uh, the, key, the key neighbors, Turkey, yes, thank you, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, and that that conference have three goals. The first is to work hard to get the uh, access, humanitarian access issue front and center and to begin to assuage the suffering of the Syrian people, which, by the way, will go some way toward uh, minimizing or reducing the appeal of jihadists. Secondly, to de-escalate the sectarian tension, because this, the extent to which there are sectarian tensions driving this, the issues become existential. And so the extent to which we can begin to de-escalate, and in particular, I would say, bring Saudi and Iran around a table to start a dialogue, I think is essential. And third, I think the destabilizing impact of Lebanon and Jordan, the socioeconomic, forgetting even the sectarian issues, the socioeconomic impacts of this crisis are so significant that I think it should be a third key goal of getting, in particular, the Gulf and Russia, countries that have not contributed proportionate to their means, to begin to help those countries on the periphery of Syria deal with the spillover. By the way, you know, I think this is a really important, very constructive kind of suggestion, particularly in the context of the longer term approach. If the consensus of this group in gaming this out is that in the short term, a Geneva-based or some other kind of political agreement seems to be impossible, if the wherewithal to cut a real deal and bring in peacekeepers and do the things that we normally associate with this doesn't seem possible, then maybe one should say is, well, what is possible over the course of the near term? Is that de-escalation? If you know, if you are, you know, if, you know, it, is less war a good pricey to sometime eventually peace? And in that context, could you then also be doing grassroots and other kinds of things that are neutralizing um, other groups, uh, driving the ripening forward, working on behind the scenes on relationships and so forth. And so you get to a phased approach where there is a process, and so long as the process is moving forward, the situation is getting somewhat better. I think, you know, I'm hearing that between the lines in a lot of this discussion, and I, and I just, I just want to circle it because, you know, if that's the outcome of this discussion, that's, a, that's quite constructive, I, I, I think. Um, Mulaz. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and I want to say that, to be honest, I think, you know, some of the main problems that we were discussing today, whether it is um, sectarianism, jihadist, economics, decentralized but effective local governance, and, and so on in Syria as, as we're going forward to sort of an overall peace plan. But as the international community is sort of stuck in this gridlock, and, and to be honest, most of the time ignoring realities on the ground. Um, I, I said a comment earlier about the best way to defeat jihadists is being through civil society. I don't think that's optimistic at all. I think it's the only realistic way of doing it. And you can only sort of, first of all, somebody mentioned the lack of a Mandela that's uh, a, an Arab Mandela that, that could rise in Syria. That he can only rise through supporting local governors, starting in villages and small communities and integrating them together as you go into a provincial level. We saw that in Aleppo. Aleppo, the, the, the one province that is completely controlled by Islamic State of Iraq and Sham, where all resources are controlled by the Islamic State, the most extreme of any faction in Syria, more extreme, I would say, than even traditional Al-Qaeda thinking. And, and the only reason people don't go out and protest isn't fear of death, but is fear of not getting bread at the end of the day. So first of all, channeling, instead of doing this arbitrarily sending humanitarian aid into Syria, channeling it only through civilian governance, where the civilian governing council, civil society, or whatever you want to call it, is not a religious scholar, nor is he or she an armed 
uh, uh, person or part of a, of a militia. And then you can only look as far as the language of the jihadists themselves to find out what their antidote is. I mean, they talk about sahwa, awakening, all the time. They go after apostates that are more important for them to kill before the regime. That's every moderate Sunni, and every civilian council, and anything like that uh, that exists. Um, and finally, you know, talking about closing borders or cutting off funding, um, I, I believe, uh, as the lady said, they're self-sustaining. In Aleppo, they've taken over uh, factories. They're able to. They've taken over everything. They're able to sell, and they have a very strong sort of economic agenda. I was really surprised in my last conversation with people in Aleppo on the inside, just the extent of consolidation of governance that they have done in that area. And so, first of all, putting translate all move, move this into a. You know, prescriptive, how do we get forward? We send all humanitarian aid only through civilian governing structures that are emerging, and, and we remember that unlike other Libya and other places, civilian society and serious civil society never actually went down. It actually just grew and became more powerful. We just never cover it in the media. And I think realizing that is the most important thing. Thinking about closing the, the Turkish border, for example, the biggest place where maybe jihadists come through, would kill the revolution. The, the Turks, easier for them domestically, politically, to, to close it, obviously. But but honestly, humanitarian aid and everything else would, would, would hinder the revolution so much. It would be the biggest favor for, for Assad. So I think really, really counting on civilian governance and in, in ensuring sort of its integration and growth is is the only way to fight jihadists, and it's the only way to, to really have a real idea of, of sort of a model of what a decentralized okay. government with some sort of central government can look like. Okay, I've got a lot of people around the table. I want to be respectful of that. Kaz. I want to come back to this issue of ripeness. And as an analyst, I'm looking at what could change over time. I think. Hans was right in pointing us towards uh, identifying power shifts as being consequential, um, shifts towards the jihadists, shifts towards Assad. But similarly, you could say that uh, um, the Western willingness to engage um, Assad in a chem negotiation, that changed the dynamic. Uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, participation in direct negotiations with Iran over the nuclear deal change the dynamic. So I've just been taking off a list of, of things that could change down the road that could be consequential, and we've touched on a number of them during the course of the, the day, uh, a split in the Alawites, uh, some, uh, something uh, happening to Assad. Uh, um, but there are a couple of others that, uh, that perhaps we haven't touched on as, as much. So if there is a successful nuclear deal involving Iran, that will, uh, that will uh, contribute to a change dynamic. But what if there's a failed uh, nuclear deal? Um, at that point, the, uh, the U.S. Is, is, and others are left with very uncomfortable uh, choices, but you could see uh, um, see a forceful outcome there. Indeed, you could see Israel and Hezbollah coming at it again, and uh, clearly that would have an effect on uh, on the Syrian dynamic. Um, there may be, and I look to others uh, on this, but there could be uh, internal dynamics in Turkey if these refugee flows uh, continue at the pace that they have that could, could lead to a changed uh, uh, Turkish uh, uh, position. Um, a changed relationship between Iran and Saudi, that would have a uh, substantial effect uh, uh, on the dynamics in the region. And then we've talked about uh, pressures on Lebanon and Jordan, if one or both of them start going down the tubes as a result of this. So uh, it seems to me out of a process like this having an effect a checklist that uh, policymakers are looking at, and if one or two or three of these start changing in a fundamental way, uh, addressing what the implications for a, a changed environment in Syria would be is, a, is an important contribution that you can make. Right, and I think one of the things that can come out of a process like this is developing a kind of a, um, an identification of drivers and then an identification of what might be considered um, uh, uh, 
red flags and tripwires, to use a, a terminology that sometimes I use when doing these kind of things, which is to say things that could happen that would indicate things are heading in one direction or another, those are red flags. And then tripwires are things that if they happen, they should motivate a change in policy or they should motivate an action. And so there's some of these things that you're talking about that are really tripwires that, you know, uh, you know should, uh, you know, motivate us or motivate the participants to say, okay, something has fundamentally changed. The opportunity may actually have changed as a result of this. Uh, because clearly, the process is not going to drive us towards pe a peace process is not going to drive us towards peace uh, as much as all the other processes, the war process, the regional political process, uh, even environmental processes. You know, I think one of the things that was struck me parenthetically as I was looking at the papers here was, you know, recalling that uh, it was a consequence of drought that led to some of the shortages that led to this particular crisis, and it was a consequence of drought that led to the food shortages that led to the Arab Spring as well. And so there are big factors here that are contributory to this kind of thing that we don't sort of take into consideration. Um, but, you know, drought and, and those of you who, I mean, you know, we, we, we can go into what the origins of those kind of droughts are and what that leads to uh, 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 as we think about it. But, I mean, the picture gets bigger and bigger. Jim. The answer to the specific question on uh, how we dealt with uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq could be a way to deal with the larger problem that you keep pushing us for concrete uh, suggestions yeah. on. First of all, it was all of the above. It was both uh, efforts to close the frontier, put the Syrians under pressure, and was also an uprising of the local communities. Uh, that isn't easy, but it can be done. Uh, in particular, the uh, Turks and to a lesser extent, but still to a significant degree, the Gulf states can be convinced to dial back uh, their support. The Turkish border could be controlled much more effectively against these people, but the question is, what do they get in return? The answer is, there has to be some uh, compromise or step back on the part of Assad and his Russian and Iranian friends. The typical uh, example would be Assad promising to step down. The United States could leverage that if the United States were willing to play a stronger role, including putting pressure on both our allies to dial back on uh, the uh, uh, support for the uh, jihadists and to put pressure on Russia and Assad and Iran to uh, uh, go for a compromise solution or face unending war with not only the jihadists but potentially with U.S. and Gulf and Turkish armed uh, more moderate forces. There's been a lot of work done on the ground quietly on that over the past year and a half. It just hasn't come to fruition, but it could, uh, not with a necessarily different American government. And I think that's the easiest thing to change because, frankly, the uh, uh, U.S. government a couple of years ago, or certainly the U.S. government in the Clinton administration, uh, would have been in a, a position where they could have used this kind of power. Uh, good point. It, it, it also suggests that as we, as we look at this and as we talk about these <laughs> Is that a victory? It's a <laughs> That's a scream to be able to get the floor to rebut this uh, uh, argument that we heard. Why would Assad give in to anything? Why would Assad take a step back? Why would Assad make a concession? He is winning. Time is on his side. He's going to continue uh, scaring. This, the is, this is what I was, gonna, I was actually going to get at, which is based on what we talked about at the beginning of this discussion, there is not a lot of incentive for him to do that. But, as is the thrust of this particular portion of the discussion, there might be things that would create incentive for him to do that, where Russia might need the United States or the situation Russia might change, the situation with Iran might change, the situation within Syria itself might change. But in all our discussions, the only concrete answer I think was given by Hans and I second him, and that is the biggest threat to the Assad regime, which is to support and assist the moderate forces. Other than that, there are no incentives. I disagree. You, there's a split in the Assad regime. This is what we've been looking for. He's a defector. Okay. <laughs> Call it what you may. One man's, one man's defector is another man's patriot. Um, to, go okay. ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but there's several points I want to make. 
ripening requires stalemate of a prolonged nature. It requires exhaustion of the parties, the cutting off of their resources, and, and them sustaining, or them suffering unsupportable losses for little or no gain. It's an ugly concept, but that's, in a civil war like this, how you get things ripened. And we and the Russians, as some have noted this morning, are not as far apart as we seem. I think the president's statement that Assad has when to... When you say we, who do you mean? The U.S. and Russia. Oh, so you really are a defector. <laughs> yeah. Uh, both powers do not want uh, the Islamists, the militant Islamists, ruling Syria or large parts of Syria. And I think both we and the Russians would be willing to find ways to cooperate and to co-opt others to stop that uh, from happening. And that gets into the whole business of getting Assad to step aside. Uh, we can offer, we and others can offer the Russians certain assurances, at least in terms of what our policies will be, uh, that might make it palatable uh, for them to okay, go work on. with us. Give, give, give one. Uh, the Alawite, it seems to me, the statistics you put up there were quite stunning about the losses the army has suffered. That is not a, those are not sustainable losses. If those continue, if that trajectory continues for any length of time, the Alawites are only about a community of two and a half million. Uh, and if they're sustaining the bulk of the losses in the army, uh, 50, 40,000, 50,000, they cannot be happy with that. They cannot want to continue uh, with that if they have an alternative to uh, having their throats cut. And I think they're willing to, they'd be willing to jettison the Assad and Mekloofs for certain security guarantees, and, but that's a strong word, guarantees. We'd have to be willing to put some skin in the game um, that center around uh, much of the army being kept intact and the reasonable opposition, or the less crazy opposition, and the opposition isn't crazy, but the, 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 if we can isolate the, the worst jihadists, uh, the reasonable opposition may be willing to cut a deal with the Alawites for power sharing and for integrating some of their forces into a military that's pledged to serve the people and uphold a new constitution and support a transition. I mean, that's, to me, uh, uh, and then, you know, those who might oppose this, I th like the Saudis, we need to go to them and say, what is it you want? You don't want the Muslim Brotherhood. You don't want the jihadists. You don't want Assad. You know, work with us a little bit here. Give us some breathing space so we can, you know, and, th and think about supporting this financially while you cut off, uh, you work with the GCC to cut off aid to the... Uh, uh, ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra and uh, those types of groups. Okay. We keep going around here. Andrew. Yeah, this will be uh, very brief uh, in terms of what it would take for us to kind of feel that our needs were met and we could, you know, withdraw from the conflict. Uh, on the map that shows the alternative outcome, a divided Syria, this gets at uh, at least two of our kind of casus belli. Uh, the first being, uh, which is mostly, you know, defending the route of advanced weapon systems into uh, into Lebanon, uh, you know, defending those logistical uh, logistical lines. The second being a, and this is ironic for Hezbollah to be talking about a security zone, given its history, but uh, <laughs> but a security zone around the northeastern Ba'a to where that cuts off a lot of the traffic of weapons and jihadis coming into uh, into Lebanon. Uh, that's the second thing. The third thing, which we haven't mentioned, is the protection of the Shia community in Syria. This is not. This does not line up on a one-one basis with the, the the Alawi community. There's a separate Shia community in in Syria, as well as Shia shrines in Syria. And I think if uh, if there were some guarantees given, either by the you know facts on the military facts on the ground or by uh, some sort of negotiated settlement to protect both Shia communities and those shrines that would not only allay a lot of the concerns of, uh, of Hezbollah, but also perhaps some of our Iraqi brethren who've, uh, who have been fighting in Syria. I would like to add to what my colleague here has said. First, I have been listening now all this afternoon about jihadis, jihadis. And here I am as Hezbollah in Syria fighting jihadis, losing men fighting jihadis, 
and once, not one single word of gratitude from the international community. Uh, I mean, I'm the one who is putting all these men and losing all my fighters there, doing that for you all, for your benefit. And I have intelligence, I have know-how, I have now networks which I can share with all of you about these jihadi networks, having been on the ground now for the last two years fighting them. Now, I have been in consultation uh, for some time now about Syria with Sayyid al-Qaid, Mr. Khamenei, and with the real leader on Syria in Iran, Mr. Soleimani. And basically, you know, while we started, entered this fight with one objective in mind, which is to prevent the military defeat of the Assad regime, and we think that has now been achieved. However, we are not as wedded to a final end game that will guarantee the political survival of Assad. There is a range of options that is available to us between military preventing military defeat of Assad and guaranteeing Assad political survival. And in between, there are a number of options that we and the Iranians will be open to, be, to discuss with the international community, to discuss with the Saudis, to discuss with others, as long as our security interests, which my colleague have mentioned, has mentioned here, are met. One, for example, there is one proposal that has now been floated in some of my media, pro Hezbollah media about a, a, the transition authority going forward, about a transition arrangement that we could live with and we could persuade our ally Assad to live with. Uh, one element of it could be to persuade Mr. Assad not to run in May 2014, and we believe that he is persuadable. Second is to think of the transitional authority, uh, uh, transitional cabinet in terms of three, I mean, three components, uh, building very much on the Lebanese uh, 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 experience of cabinet formation. We can think of a, a transitional authority or cabinet uh, that consists of 10 people that uh, are selected by the Assad regime that are acceptable to all, you know, the other players, uh, regional and international. Uh, we can think of another 10 uh, that are to be selected based on the internal opposition and maybe some expat opposition that are acceptable also to us and to Mr. Assad. And we can think of a third that is selected by the international community. So these are three components of a transitional authority that could help usher Syria toward a final kind of political agreement. We don't believe that this transitional period uh, should be preconditioned on Assad departure. We can keep Mr. Assad there uh, as president since the executive powers will be invested in this transitional cabinet. But, uh, and, then, and then at the end of a year, two year, whatever transitional period we can get, agree on, then we can leave it up to the, uh, to the Syrian people uh, after having introduced the necessary constitutional reform to decide who should run for their president. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I'd like to offer just a couple of suggestions for things I think we could do very easily right now. These are very sort of practical and not particularly glamorous. Um, and they are tied to the delivery of our humanitarian assistance. Um, one thing that I think would help um, quite a bit is if we could make our humanitarian assistance more flexible. Um, right now, as everyone has mentioned, we are seeing a lot of tensions between the refugee communities and the host communities in Jordan and Lebanon. One of the main reasons there's a lot of tension is over things like water. Right now, humanitarian assistance is very difficult to use to address those kinds of things. The Complex Crisis Fund is the only fund in the U.S. government right now that can be used for those kinds of things. Um, a number of NGOs are starting to focus on that work, um, improving water systems overall to reduce the pressure on water. Um, so that there are less tensions. So anyway, make humanitarian assistance uh, more flexible so that it can deal with some of the root causes of tensions between the refugee and host communities. Um, another thing that I think would be um, uh, an interesting uh, thing that we could do more of is to try and build a constituency for peace among refugee leaders. 
Um, the refugee leaders um, are, in theory, represented by the rebel, uh, the opposition leaders. Um, and I do think that they have a role to play in pressuring a fragmented, moderate opposition to come together to fight on their behalf, the people in the refugee camps. So I think we're sort of not thinking about the leaders in the camps as a potential source of pressure um, for internal actors, um, but they'll need some help to come together to build their position to negotiate um, within the camps. This is actually something that uh, some NGOs are doing um, with uh, leaders in refugee camps, although not about influencing opposition inside Syria, but rather how do they manage affairs more effectively within the refugee camps themselves. Um, the third thing that I think we could do a great deal more of through our current humanitarian assistance that we're not, um, there are 4.6 million young people uh, and children who are affected by this conflict. Um, this is an enormous pool of recruits, of recruits for radical groups. Um, it is, they need a great deal more than just basic assistance and education. These young people need to feel like they're doing something meaningful with their lives. Um, that they're making some kind of contribution to their communities. Um, again, there are all sorts of things you can do under the umbrella of humanitarian assistance with young people that might give them options that would, that would lead them away from uh, a more militant posture. These are things like engaging young people in the delivery of humanitarian assistance. These are youth leadership training programs. These are psychosocial programs for young people. But these are still a tiny, tiny part of our humanitarian assistance. And so if we can start rethinking how to use that, you know, the billions that are going in, in a way to shape the future piece, uh, I think it would be worth exploring. Karen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, on your... <clears throat> On your issue about what could uh, change, I just wanted to pick up on the point. I think um, if the Iranian-U.S. deal is actually finalized and concluded, um, that that will lead to changes in Saudi-Iranian relations and even Saudi-U.S. relations, that they will be more once that's a, quote, done deal, they will be m more interested in being at least less publicly critical of the U.S. and more interested in um, a dialogue with Iran on reducing the sectarian um, issue um, so that it becomes possible, maybe. Um, to have to have a, a a dialogue about uh, it's not um, we don't need to um, have <clears throat> have Sunni Shia strife as the um, as the future as far as the eye can see that it's in our interest. And certainly, um, I would argue, in the interest of everybody in the region, to have that uh, that tension reduced. I think if the deal is not done, the uh, the opposite happens. The Saudi search for friends uh, in the region in intensifies. You know, who can we rely on in Syria? Who can we rely on in Iraq? Um, and those are basically not the governments right now. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Um, as Levin, our job here today has mostly been to be disengaged and look nervous about <laughs> the trend of events. Which, in... by the way, you've done a great Thank job. You. Thank you. It was harder than you think. <laughs> um, but I think I'd like to comment from a Lebanese perspective. There's always been a, a strong feeling that the solution in Syria was going to rely on regional players coming together and reaching some kind of agreement, maybe not always invoking Taif, but um, something that is reminiscent of Taif. The problem has been, though, that ripeness has been reached for different groups of players at different points and because of different factors. Syria and the opposition, they, uh, they don't appear to have reached a point of ripeness yet. The U.S. and EU may or may not have achieved ripeness at various stages. Iran and Hezbollah, I think, have a very def a different definition of what would prompt them to feel that the time was ripe to come to a solution. 
I think we heard about Russia, what some of the factors might be to make Russia change its stance and, and look for a peaceful solution. But the one intersection among all those groups of players may be when those effects of the Syria conflict start taking material form in both Lebanon and Jordan. And so the question I would pose from the Lebanese aspect is, rather than allow our analytical construct to be tested that it's only when sectarian violence breaks out in Lebanon or when Jordan starts to feel even more serious stresses than they do now, what are the possible steps that could be taken in advance of that stage? If we all agree that that's when we come together, why can't we just skip the stage of having Lebanon <laughs> break down into violence and move right into whatever the kinds of, of um, procedures would be or processes would be in order to move to that uh, piece that you're, you're trying to define here? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Paul? I have uh, three points, and one of them connects a little bit, uh, if uh, indirectly, to that, but it was more a response, actually, to Mona's comment uh, earlier about encouraging Russia uh, and others who had uh, uh, not contributed proportionately to helping the countries on the periphery uh, to do that. And uh, I, I guess I think it's rather unlikely uh, that Moscow would agree to do that. Uh, and I, I suspect that the response would be that uh, responsibility for the conditions in those countries lays with those outside forces that exacerbated the civil war in Syria by supporting the opposition to the legitimate government of the country. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, Russia is unlikely to, uh, to do that. Uh, I guess the, the second thing, uh, we were having the discussion of Iran and what, what might happen if there were a U.S.-Iran uh, deal. Uh, and I guess from a, a Russian perspective, if there's a U.S.-Iran deal, uh, then Moscow pushes even harder to get Iran really in a formal way uh, into the, the process. And, uh, you know, at, at that point, I think the Russian uh, message to Washington would be, well, you know, now, now what's your objection, right? Uh, so uh, uh, that's something uh, possibly to think about. And the last one is, is more of kind of a general point in, in thinking about Russia's approach to this uh, problem. Uh, I would make an analytical distinction between uh, uh, things that we can hope to win support or uh, active assistance uh, from Russia to do uh, versus uh, things that Russia may be prepared to accept and to live with. Uh, and uh, if the situation uh, on the ground in Syria really deteriorated, uh, and if the extremists were making really significant gains, uh, and if those gains were coming uh, mostly at the expense of the regime uh, rather than uh, the Syrian opposition, uh, then maybe we would get to a place where Russia could live with uh, some kind of external uh, intervention, whether uh, uh, military or otherwise, uh, that, that it won't really uh, be uh, too keen to accept uh, now. So. You know, as we draw to the end of this thing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a million thoughts are running through my head. You know, we, we started out, we laid a groundwork, we talked about peace, we then, as we started drilling down in terms of the interests of the various groups around the table, you know, the traditional pro approach to peace seemed to be an unlikely thing in the near term, uh, and so we began to explore what might be able to happen over the course of the near term, whether it was a fragmented state um, or some kind of a, um, a phased set of agreements that, that ultimately got us to where we were going. And we've had here in this course of this conversation some you know, fairly different approaches, all of which are constructive and substantive and sort of work within this framework that we've talked about. Mona had a, 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 an approach where we, we talk about a first period where we were sort of reduce conflict, de-intensify the conflict at the beginning, and then perhaps, you know, with time and the progress and a number of other things, we might uh, get to something more uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, traditional in terms of political restructuring and, and, and on to uh, a piece. Uh, Ted talked about ways that we might be able to, you know, cut a deal and lead to a transition within the Assad government. Um, Rhonda even talked about a structure of a transitional government um, that might be acceptable, uh, 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 admittedly, to Hezbollah and Assad, but, but, and, and, and well, above all, Iran. Um, and, and, you know, that, that, that was also constructive in terms of an approach. All of these are more drawn out than commonly discussed. All of these are uh, more incremental. And all of them, you know, if there's a common theme to them, it's get what you can get now and then move forward. Build a process where you have small successes that lead to bigger successes if you can't have bigger successes going forward. Um, and, you know, that seems to be a constraint that's working here. Now I'm going to turn to um, Kristen in a second to get sort of her take on, on some of these broader conclusions. And I will admit, you know, I will stipulate, you know, in terms of this sort of first truncated piece came in. I must have missed it. It's a bit of a curveball to sort of to sort of take two and a half sessions out of the thing and and to try to condense it down to time. That still the idea of bringing together experts and having them play roles um, and tackling some of the issues via the role playing has been illuminating. Stress testing the issues uh, and certainly having a little bit more time would have enabled us to do that in a bit of a more orderly fashion. Um, uh, and, and so some of this has been a little bit imp impressionistic, um, but we'll learn from, the, from these experiences. But I'm struck, and I don't know if you're struck by this, but I, you know, one of the things that strikes me is this is driven by a couple of really big themes, one of which is an absolutely profound and fundamental shift in our view of what the United States and the Western goals are in this part of the world in terms of the level of engagement, but also you know, from 1979 until now, Iran was the big enemy. And most of our relationships in the region and most of our actions in the region were oriented towards dealing with that threat. And over the course of the past several years, and not just now, but over the course of the past several years, we've started accepting a shift in that, both in terms of, you know, how, you know what the leadership structure in Iraq, um, in, in terms of where we're going now with this nuclear deal and so forth. And that if you accept that, if you have the leader of the Western powers um, and the most influential voice within an important group of the regional powers, accepting a different role for Iran in the region, it changes the dynamic of this thing, you know, turns it on its head. It's absolutely stunning. Um, and it comes out of you know, uh, you know, something that I sort of, you know, I'm just, again, this is just a personal view, but I've restrained myself in personal views up until now. I just want to throw one in. But it comes out of this notion that somehow Islamist extremist groups are a bigger threat, that they're the big threat out there, that they're the bogeyman, and that that's what motivates public opinion in the United States and elsewhere more than a hegemonic threat in the region or some of the other things that have motivated us in the past. And, you know, we can debate that till the cows come home, but it's a big deal. And one of the questions that I think needs to be asked in a different kind of a forum from this is, is that right? Do, do Islamist extremist groups actually pose a bigger threat to the interests of the United States and Western powers than others with hegemonic interests in the region or others with just simply a different geopolitical agenda than the United States. That's something that there hasn't been a huge amount of debate about, but just underneath all this, it's, it's a pivot in terms of how we tackle these things. Anyway, maybe we could hear from you and then we can wrap this up. Sure, David. I will give a few personal reflections after listening to you all today. Uh, before I do that, though, I really, really want to thank all of you for coming today and participating in this experiment. I really want to thank Foreign Policy, and we've had a terrific partnership with them, so thank you. 
I want to thank all of my colleagues here at the U.S. Institute of Peace. And you know, when you have a project like this that engages vice presidents and your external relations staff and your program assistants and your receptionists and your security guards and your public affairs team and everybody else, it is extremely unwise to single anybody out. I am going to do that anyway. I, I would like to single out Rachel Brandenburg and Jeff Cranto, without whom this game would not have been possible. Thank you. I know David may m want to be similarly unwise or not with, uh, with his own team, but I just want to thank the whole FP team as well as all of you. Now let me give some of my own reflections. Um, I'm coming not just to this game today, but to this job at the U.S. Institute of Peace with a background much more in national security and in war than in peace building. And indeed, what I have been reminded of today is what a frustrating and challenging job peace building is and uh, how lonely it is, as you can see, as I'm left of here at the end of the day. Uh, but well, you, you drove these people away, obviously. I <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but I did want to say that you gave me in some ways more hope than I expected today. And it's not because peace in Syria is any easier than I had foreseen, but perhaps you illuminated for me more paths to peace. While they may not be likely, there may be more of them than I had imagined. And let me express what I mean. Uh, first, you suggested that there could be global solutions to peace, which would involve potentially the UN or great powers coming together or other regional powers coming together that could make a difference in the conflict. You also illuminated, though, that the solutions could come more locally, whether in local communities or within the region, and perhaps the solutions lie there, and that there could be some solutions lying there. You illuminated that some of the solutions might come from friends, traditional allies pulling closer together. But what I heard a lot of today is that the solutions may come from traditional enemies. And that may be both within Syria, between some elements of the Assad regime or the Alawite community and the more moderate elements of the opposition. Or it could be between traditional opponents or enemies in the region, the Saudis and the Iranians. Perhaps if there's a deal between the Iranians and the United States, perhaps there is some making of a, as an end in sight in Syria there. And also, we learned that some of the solutions may come from the strong. Again and again, I was struck at how traditional some of the solutions we uh, discussed uh, appeared. Uh, this was the, the role, bring in the strong, the outside powers, great power, power politics, imposing a solution. Many of you here today pointed to that. But we also heard that perhaps the weak were actually the solution to the problem. Uh, perhaps it was civil society, perhaps it was even people in refugee camps who could somehow come together and rise up and be the leaders that we need to see and impose uh, some and develop some of these new models uh, when the old models clearly aren't working. Uh, so with that, David, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I don't need that, that, the microphone. I, you know, I do want to you know, be unwise in the same way. Uh, the terrific group of people from foreign policy have uh, been involved in this process from the beginning. Uh, Deb Cunningham, who runs our events division, Alex Glass, who runs it with her, have played a critical role. Jess Dillman on the communication staff. A bunch of the folks on our editorial team have been involved. And I do want to point out in, in that respect that Peace Game is a process. It's not an event that takes place in one day. We are doing this event here. Uh, every six months, we'll, we'll alternate between one here and one in the Middle East. So it's an ongoing dialogue. We also have the Peace Channel on the website, and there will be a constant flow of articles into that, and perhaps some of you may at some point wish to contribute to that. We want to have as big a dialogue as we can, both through that. When we be, do the Peace Game in the spring, we're going to commence a program of outreach to universities where we're going to pose certain questions to them. They will do, there will be an essay contest. Some of the winners of those contests will be able to actually join us in the Peace Games. Uh, part of the Peace Game uh, package involved uh, underwriting subscriptions to foreign policy and access to all of this for the students at the top 10 international affairs schools in the United States. So there is that kind of an outreach. And who knows? We may think of other things, smaller lunches, other kinds of programs along the way that we will, you know, that we want to incorporate in this rigorous, disciplined look at the processes that lead to peace, identifications of the challenges looking for alternative views, bringing together terrific minds like all of yours in that process. I also want to uh, point out that Claire Casey and Zach Ratner and some of the team from 
Garten Rothkopf, which is another company that I'm involved with, uh, are the people that put together the slides and the questions and, 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 and some of the substantive background uh, associated with this. Uh, they have done a terrific job, as, as they, they always do. Um, but I guess what you get from this is the USIP uh, group that's been led by Jim, but by Kristen from the very, very beginning, and that great team and this team from FP are all committed to this, are all working together to take this start of this one day and build it into something uh, that we think will be very, very different. That's one of the hallmarks that Krista and I have flagged from the beginning. We don't want to do things that are the same as everything else. We want to look for new formats. We want to look for new ways. We want to bring new voices into the discussion. Uh, and hopefully, you can help us with that. The secret to the success of this effort will be if everything we do is better than what we've done today, which is not to say what we've done today hasn't been terrific. You have all made an enormous contribution. Um, you have had a wonderful dialogue. It is better than we could have hoped for. But we want to make it better every day by getting your suggestions, getting your input, getting your articles, getting you to future events, having you suggest other people that could be involved. And the two teams that we've got working together can really build this into something that we think can be influential uh, and really deliver a message uh, to, the, to the, the policy teams and others who are working on this. That said, we've worked you hard for the day. Um, you know, Snowmageddon, you know, two is coming. You know, all of the three inches that will shut down Washington. Uh, those of, you know, all of us who live here in Washington know that even if there's no snow, Washington will be shut down, but that's another issue. Um, but, you know, just so that you don't go and get into these problems, Kristen, poor Kristen, has come here today, despite the fact that there's no power at her house, um, that she, they, they lost power yesterday, and three inches of snow could knock out this entire area. Um, so uh, we appreciate your flexibility in dealing with us changing the schedule. Um, and we hope you'll join us at future of these events. And if I may ask, join me in thanking everybody here for a terrific day. Thank you all very much.